Thank you, Carol. Thanks for it's nice to be back here. <clears throat> so I'm going to share my screen, share it so that I can do full. OK, so I'm going to um, run, try to do this faster than I did <laughs> last year. Where I went too long, so I'll set my timer. And uh, so that we can have more, because I thought the questions were actually the most useful. So in terms of a portfolio, I'm going to talk about two types of portfolios, because uh, it sort of depends what your what the purpose is. And I'm sure that there's many more portfolios that are types of portfolios, depending on, on kind of what, what what type of firm you're you're looking to work at or um <clears throat> or sort of other other kinds of activities that you need like a portfolio for 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 uh, scholarships or also for grad school so i'm going to talk particularly about grad school portfolios and then job portfolios and talk a little bit about resumes which always go hand in hand um <clears throat> so the portfolio is primarily about the content of the work but it's also about the ability of its designer to communicate ideas and images in graphic form uh, it also tells the viewer how well a designer is able to display a whole body of work as a coherent whole uh, so um so that's important like can you organize information clearly and communicate clearly and I think in addition to the work you've done, it's how you're presenting that work. Um, so obviously you all, sorry about the poor, when I exported, it got a little bit fuzzy, but so obviously the most common tool that people use is Adobe InDesign, which is a multi-page multi software that allows you to ensure that the layout is consistent from page to page. Um, and the first thing that a graphic designer wouldn't have this fuzzy slide, but would tell you is really that the grid is to establish a grid. So the grid uh, is really kind of what allows you to organize the information and and make sure that it is that there's some consistency across uh, the entire portfolio. Um, it also gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, so it doesn't mean that every every page should be the same, but it does allow you to say that there are uh, similarities between pages and that some of the content should be found in the same place on the on the page. Um, so for example, the first page maybe is always similar or that there's certain ways that you treat text that's always similar. So that is one of the ways similar to a building or any other kind of design uh, that there are aspects to that that repeat and that there is some organizing structure for the information. Uh, typically, portfolios are organized as a spread, meaning that you're looking at a left hand page and a right hand page and the center of that spread is the kind of establishes the uh, kind of the layout so that the left and the right page um the the main information for example like the gutters and other things that are part of that are symmetrical across across those that spread um so while it's important to have consistency from page to page it's also nice to have some things that break that consistency. So you might have, and particularly in longer portfolios where you're uh, versus, let's say, a work sample. And we'll talk about those differences. What's the difference between a portfolio and a work sample? Uh, so a, a portfolio is usually many pages for each project, and a work sample might be, you know, might be limited to five pages, and you might just have the most inform important information for each each project on one page. So, um, so again, uh, it's important that you have a kind of a clear uh, 
system of organizing information. And here's two examples that kind of show that difference. So this left hand side uh, is sort of a poor layout because there's no hierarchy to the information and every section is treated differently. Sometimes things are center justified, sometimes they're left justified. There isn't a kind of a clear way to navigate that versus the one on the right, which has a, a structure to it that kind of helps people understand how the information is um, kind of what's a heading versus what's an image and how that the text is laid out that is associated, for example, with each image. So when you're setting up um, the, the grid in a software, um, usually there is, it's called, usually we set up what's called a double line grid. And it basically sets up uh, not just the, the where the images might go, but it also establishes the distance between images so that, that the images are always kind of located uh, within, uh, are, are allowed to be separated by a similar margin. So typically images can be placed very close together, maybe an eighth or three sixteenths apart, uh, versus the text, uh, which you want to have enough space around the text so that it doesn't kind of jam up against the images. This will be clear. I'm going to show you a lot of examples for good portfolios that I've found over the years. Um, in terms of the text, um, often people recommend that you try to use like one text, I would say one font type, and to not um, get too complicated with text sizes and bolds and other, you know, using multiple texts because it actually makes the information uh, it sort of detracts from the central focus of the information, which is your your work. So something that is, you know, establish a font size, a font type, um, kind of make sure that there is, you know, at most maybe two hierarchies, like the heading is one size and the rest of the text is all one size instead of having it range, you know, having this huge range of different fonts and different sizes, it, it makes the information confusing. Um, uh, typically architects lean towards what's called a sans serif font, and you can go to um, Adobe and find kind of the list. They will tell you what are serif fonts and what are sans serif fonts. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't use serif fonts. It's just to sort of, it, it, I guess it's a legacy of modernism that we're still under that, that kind of establishes um, a kind of clarity to certain kinds of text that, is, that has to do with not having too many embellishments. Um, and again, if you have text, which I would recommend, think about how the text is also going to be readable. So if you look, if you think about a newspaper, newspaper text is usually organized in columns, which makes it easier to read. And typically text is left justified and has, I know a lot of people like to have full justified, which means that the distance on the left and the right is the same. And that works okay for short amounts of text, but it makes it very difficult to read longer amounts of text because your eye actually knows um, kind of where it is on the on a text block based on the the kind of raggedness of the right uh, line. So um, usually I would suggest that if you've got a lot of text that you organize it as a series of columns and here's some different examples of how that could be uh, organized. Uh, students often like to do this because it's sort of trendy as center justified texts, um, which is fine. It's a, it's a kind of very classical way to organize uh, text and other information, but it's also very difficult to do well. So um, 
you know, I would say if you're interested in doing that, the best way to do it is to maybe look at some books. And I would generally recommend looking at art books or other things that have uh, <clears throat> have a combination of text and images to see kind of what the rules are for for not just for any um, for left for center justified text, but really for any any kind of organization. All right, image quality, which I didn't do in this presentation, is important that the images are very clear. Um, and remember, somebody might be printing your portfolio. Nowadays, <clears throat> most people submit portfolios uh, as PDFs. Uh, so it's important to sort of think about how they might be received and if they're going to, they may be printed on the other side. Uh, typically now we recommend that people don't do very complicated sort of sizes and to stick to like an eight and a half by 11 uh, format so that and and not do full bleed images so that it can actually full bleeds when the image goes all the way to the edge of the paper. Um, the printers will will always crop it so so. Uh, because most printers don't print all the way to the edge of the paper. So think about kind of how the information is going to be received on the other side. Um, in terms of image quality, they don't have, the images don't have to be huge, but they have to be big enough so that when it's printed, the amount uh, that the information, that the image is still uh, clear so that it doesn't get pixelated. So, um, so usually now we go by sizes of, you know, the total um, dots per inch of an image, but um, uh, you can sort of think about something like 150 DPI is probably fine for something that's going to be printed, you know, by three, three inches by five inches on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Um, <clears throat> so again, repeating elements. Um, so you don't need to repeat things that are obvious, like for example, your name or things that are already at the at the introduction. So you don't have to put things or like add decorative like borders. I think all of those things become really a distraction. What you want to have is that there is like a front page that tells people kind of who you are and what what the portfolio is, and then only repeat things which are really important. For example, that three pages are from fifth year, or two pages are from fourth year. This is professional work or this is school work, but not not necessarily everything. Um, that tell not every page has to have all of your information on it. The other thing is to think about how the portfolio is organized. So in this example by OMA, SML Excel, uh, he organizes projects by size, so small to large. Um, for most people, typically you organize the information by the the work that you've done by the most recent, just like a portfolio to older work, or at least kind of what you consider to be the most important projects at the beginning, and then maybe less important projects at the end. Um, all right, so this gets a little wonky. This, at least you will have this information, um, you can have that on there, but uh, when you're doing an InDesign layout, I'm just gonna, zoom out of this thing for a second, cut out of this thing. So this is the kind of, this is our sort of standard template that we use for InDesign. So you basically will start with a new InDesign file. And then um, if you go to the, there is a lot of things that will tell you kind of how you can set up uh, things that are standard. So for example, like the number of columns or the number of, of grid lines, and that can all be pre-set up. Um, and basically you would go <coughs> to your master page, which is the page that's got 
most of the information. So here in InDesign, you'll see that there's the aster. So if you click on that one, that's where you have all of the information that's going to repeat, like a page number or the grid. And then you add the vertical grid by using columns. So if you go um, to layout, you'd go, you could create margins and columns. It'll pop up this um, interface and it will tell you, you set what the margins are, the number of columns, the gutter, that's the space between the columns. And then, so you'd say, okay, and that would give you that layout. This layout is the one, like I said, that we use, and you can see that it's been organized in a certain way so that um, when you get to the information, basically everything that you need to have on there is aligned to the grid. So here's your text, it's aligned to that grid, that text is aligned, and these things, if you set up the grid properly, they just snap into place. So there's many, many tutorials online on how to do this. It's sort of not really within the purview of this class, but so you can see that there's certain information in this grid that we have that the left-hand column is always used for kind of, you know, addresses. The text is always on the, um, starts on the second column. You can see that there's the distance these gutters are wide enough so that you can have, um, that's about a quarter of an inch, so that there's enough distance between the information. And then you can set up images, basically. You can set up a lot of different formats within that same system, as long as you're sort of aware what, what it is that you're repeating. Right, so the numbers of the images are always here, the numbers of the kind of other uh, images are here for, for, for a biography or of CV, it's all done in the same way. In our case, we only use one font and it's everything is exactly the same size. So there's not a lot of uh, hierarchy. The hierarchy is not defined by the text, it's defined by where it appears on the page. So that's a kind of our own kind of maybe strategy, but you should develop a strategy that's also very straightforward and simple. Um, so again, here's the interface for the margins and columns, and then you can create the guides. Those are the blue lines that, the, that set up the the kind of the grid, and then you can tell it how many rows you want, how many columns, you know, whether you want it to fit within the margin or within the page, and then it will set up this grid for you. You can also find online a lot of these grids pre-made. They're free, so I might start with that. Download one of the ones that a graphic designer has already made, and you can use that as your starting point. And then, um, So here again, you can see kind of how that grid system sort of allowed them to kind of organize the columns, secondary information, text, headings, um, or this one, these posters, you could see the kind of mod modular grid system that kind of allows you to, to place all of the information into it. Um, uh, again, these are more information about grids. So within this one single grid that you see over here on the right um, is um, then you can you can imagine these are all of the variations that you can have within that grid using that grid system. And so you can have different types of information. So let's say that you had model photographs and you wanted to have a lot of them or you wanted to have one large image or multiple images. All right, so I will show you examples, but in the meantime, uh, I thought I would I'm gonna just make this bigger so it's easier to find everything. Talk a little bit about work portfolios. So typically this is what we receive and every office might be a little bit different. Um, so we would have 
a cover letter, which is usually just the email, a one page resume, and then a portfolio with six to 10 pages and maybe one to two pages per project. Keep it at a small scale without creating fuzzy images and then show evidence of your skills. Obviously, they want to see what you're capable of doing. So that means showing a range of drawings, plans, sections, models, renderings, details, wall sections. Uh, include projects that you worked on at an office if you have them. And the cover letter should be two to three paragraphs explaining who you are and why you're interested in the office. If you can find out who's hiring and or who the principal is and address the letter email to them. Don't send mass emails addressed to whom it may concern. Usually everybody just deletes those. Um, um, okay, so uh, for the explanations for each project, you should include, if it's a school project, the name of the project, the location, the year in which you did the project, first year, second year, third year, if it's a group project, explain what it was, and then also include the faculty member. And I'm not saying that just because I'm faculty, but often people will in firms may recognize the faculty member. And so that's sort of helpful. They might call me and say, oh, do you know this person? Or, uh, write a short paragraph that describes the location, the program, and the major idea of the design. Write in short sentences, make sure that it's well written, ask somebody to proofread the text, grammatical errors and spelling mistakes, typos, which you'd be surprised how many of that we see. And that shows that there's a kind of lack of care in the work, which will probably hurt you. For grad school portfolios, those are a little bit different. They tend to be much longer because they really want to understand each project in terms of your thinking behind each project. So it's usually three to four or even sometimes more pages per project. You want to show evidence of your thought process. That means showing how you approach the project, diagrams, drawings, longer text. Um, and then you can include projects that you work that um, depending, you know, sort of how interesting they are uh, to that, to the school that you're applying to. Um, okay, and that rest of this is the same. For, for the cover letter, which I know you're gonna go over in another um, presentation, but I'll just go over it again here. Uh, I think the cover letter is actually one of the things that will get people to actually open your portfolio if you send them portfolio. So it's incredibly important. Um, and right now we receive, you know, many, many of these a week. And I would say maybe only one or a month is actually kind of properly addressed in terms of that you think, okay, they actually are interested in our office. So it's important that you actually do a little bit of research. Don't, you know, mass mail 50 firms, think about the two, three firms that you're interested in working for and be thoughtful about kind of why you're interested in those offices. So I, and make sure that it's personal so that the people who are receiving that in the, your portfolio understand that, that you have, you know something about the firm that you're applying to. So I've reviewed your website, you know, I'm impressed with your projects, list an actual project that you find, explain what you liked about it. I'm writing to express my strong interest in joining your team as a, and then explain what it is. So what do you want to do, right? You wanna join the office. And then what do you think your position might be, a junior architectural designer? And then just bullet point your credentials so that people can find them quickly without looking at your portfolio bachelor's degree, professional experience, proficiency in these softwares. Um, and then just say, blah, blah, blah. It lists who might recommend you, you know, whether it's an employer or a previous professor and say that they can be listed as references. Uh, in it's 
everybody's it's a very small community so most people know each other so it's always good to kind of list who's who's out there to vouch for your work and before sir before you like jump on i'm going to also add that you said this before but one of the things that's important is that it could be an email your cover letter doesn't need to be a letter anymore oftentimes bigger firms have hiring managers and the cover letter may not make it with the portfolio, but an email can easily get forwarded with the portfolio as an attachment. So I think a lot of times the email can be your cover letter without it being a separate document. Yeah, absolutely. Just the email. Nobody's going to open attachments unless they read your email. Yes. So in terms of your resume, I have some examples um, to show you, but it basically has your name, your address, your cell phone, email, education, work experience, and then anything else, skills. So I'm going to show you go through, I think it's always better to show uh, examples. So I try to cross out the names, but maybe they're not so clear. Let me zoom. Let me put this. I see I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. All right, so, um, so in the portfolio here, um, what happened to this thing? Oh, sorry, I skipped over to the wrong one. Okay, so we have the education here. I thought this one was very well organized. So names and addresses, your education, any kind of recognition you've had, which is always nice to see, your skills, uh, the experiences, and then you know your references. So this person managed to get everything in one page, which is helpful. Um, here's another one, uh, which is similar, which has got the names, the education, recognitions, skills, actually it's almost the same professional experience, academic experience. And then this one is done a little bit differently, but name, education, exhibition and awards, that's pretty similar. Professional experience, contact information, and then the skills. So those are basically, you know, you can get everything on one page, it's got everything that you want to the two columns is very helpful. All right, and then in terms of um, um, in terms of like a work sample, so I'm going to show the differences. So a lot of the ones I have are grad school applications, but this is a work sample. So this one. Is, was very minimal, but it sort of shows the quality um, of the information. So you have a single image of the project, an explanation, right, on the left, what the status is under construction, a short description that says kind of what the project was. And then this one is important for professional work because we don't work in isolation is what did you do on that project? So this one's got something, always has a category that says project involvement, and it says schematic design through construction administration, including production of all permitted and construction drawings on the project. And then it's listed over here as professional work. And then this is the second page of it. And it's nice because we see both kind of graphic information, you know, two renderings, which, uh, he obviously he did, and then a variety of kinds of drawings. So very beautifully done plan drawing, you know, a, an elevation drawing, and then three details of the project that kind of show an understanding of, of obviously kind of we understand what the project is, and then there's a, a kind of a visual way to communicate that this person kind of understands how to detail a project, which is important for an office. Here's another one. So this is the name of the project with two photographs. And then the key 
piece of this project was this kind of tilted window. And so then it shows the wall section next to it of that particular series of photographs. And again, it says kind of what the project was, what the status is, which means whether the project was completed, what the explanation was and what the project involvement was. It's very short, but I think it's, it's a sort of very clear, you can quickly kind of go through it. And then here's some other kind of examples. I'll kind of clip through it. What's nice about it is that the format's the same, similar, right? So we have, you can see the use of the grid um, where we have sometimes three images, sometimes four images. Here we have three images, but there's also a variety of kinds of information depending on the projects. <clears throat> so here are some that are construction photographs, you know, under construction, other ones, like I said, were wall sections, other ones were plans. And so you get a pretty good detail. Here's some renderings of a project uh, that's in the permitting phase. And then it says again, project involvement. Um, and here's some other examples. So every project, this now is, uh, this is also professional work. Uh, and then academic work. So, so the, the only difference you see here, there's a subcategory and it says academic work, what the, what the projects are. And they, are, they also show a variety of types of drawings, axonometrics, renderings, diagrams, um, models, uh, without being like a page for models or a page like every project has. So you a very a different set of information. So you can really understand the kind of range of skills that the person has and the kind of way they think through projects. Um, here's another, this one is also a kind of work sample. Um, sorry, kind of long. So this is uh, this is actually a little bit similar. That there's the title, the name, you know, who the thesis advisor was, a description of it, and then there's a photograph of the model, and then a series of diagrams and a site plan, a row of axonometrics, and then some other model photographs. Um, and then this is the next project. And it kind of shows you, again, a range of images, two on there. Uh, but the layout is very straightforward. You can see that the we always understand where we are, that this is the first page of a new project because it has, has the kind of heading, the, you know, the location, the name of kind of where the work was done, who the instructor was, and a short description in two columns, um, and then the images. And then the other pages kind of are still using a kind of grid, but they're they show again a range of sometimes many small images or sometimes, and then again, this is the beginning of another project. And then you see, it's nice to see the information like people, were, if you're doing models to show things under production, and there's that one. I'm gonna run through these pretty quickly so that we have time for questions. Um, this one is done a little bit differently. So um, there is sort of drawing, a lot of drawings in this one, but again, kind of a range. Of, and then again, you understand that this is a new project. It's got the heading, kind of who, the, who it was for, an explanation, so that we understand that it's the cover page. And then again, the first page of every project should be <clears throat> laid out in a similar way. 
And then there's kind of different kinds of information. And again, the heading in this one, he also included some construction drawings in there so that people would understand kind of details. Um, this was a recent graduate. Uh, so it's got a heading, again, the first page, the name of the project, the information, fall 2020, what class it was for, what the, what the class was, and then a single image, and then the drawings. And then again, the first page, single image, information on the left and then the use of the kind of grid. Um, what am I doing for time? I have a little bit of time. All right, a um, couple more. Um, so again, the kind of index of what's in here, the resume, so in this case, name, information, they put it all into the portfolio, which is fine too. Education, what your involvements are, awards, any experience you have, and then your skills or proficiencies, uh, which would include software or languages. And then again, the left, it's got the title, and then an explanation, program, diagrams, and then a series of drawings. This one's a little bit longer. Um, there's a kind of a tone <clears throat> to the project, but it doesn't mean that every, you know, sometimes people think every single drawing needs to be exactly the same. I think what's important is that we know, okay, we're now in a new project, we know what it is, when it was done, um, what the information is, what the design guidelines are, and then you can see the kind of information that's plans. And So those are kind of longer ones. This is another one. This is for grad school, I think, application. So you've got a cover page. These are, this is a spread. So this is one page and this is another page. But you have, again, the title. <laughs> they put the, the location as a, I'm not sure. I think I would put like the actual place. That's a little bit hard. It seems a little bit esoteric, but um, an explanation of the project. And on the right hand page, like a single image. One of the other things that you'll notice in all of these that's very successful is that there's a lot of white around the page. So for example, in this one, the, the top part, um, you know, we've got this little box of information here, which the title, and then there is a kind of implied line across the top, this actually starts here. Anyway, it starts kind of here. Oh. I'm using my left hand right now, so it's a little complicated, but so yeah, so here we have the top of the page and then there's the, the top part is left white. So this, is a kind of aesthetic decision, but it does kind of make the information maybe more important because there's a lot of white paint, a lot of white space around it. So it kind of gives it a, a kind of clarity. Um, and then you can see that line is again here. So everything above that line here is, is white, except for the information about what the project is. And then the rest of the information is always below that line. So this is for a, this is a kind of idea about it. It's almost like an art book. Um, and you can see that that's dealt with consistently across 
kind of all the project, at least in the first page, right? The kind of beginning of every project. And then you have other, other layouts. And then again, we have South LA. There's another one where you see people working on some project, which is kind of nice. Um, again, and the only thing that changes in terms of scale is that we have one size, which is bigger, which is the heading. And then everything else is the same size font. And then the first page of a project always has the same layout with a single image on the right. And then the other information, you can see that there's a kind of consistency to it, but there's also variation. So the student ended up going to Princeton. Oh, and then there's a kind of project credits at the end. Um, See, I'll just show one more and then we'll all right. This is another grad school one. Um uh, oh, is it? No, this is also a double page spread. So we have this is the page, these are both eight and a half elevens. It's just that there's, it's the way that it was printed on PDF. So this is a right-hand page, the index, a single image, and then an explanation of the project. This is their thesis. So there's a lot of text. Um, and then again, information, what's the title, what's the where is the, where it's located, whether it was a competition or a student project, an explanation. Uh, the images are mostly grayscale and black and white, but I think it does give you a very clear idea of the drawings, like very clean, clean drawings. Um, and then there's just a little bit of minimal use of color every once in a while. Plans. model photographs. This one, everything was treated a certain way so that everything was fairly consistent. You don't necessarily have to do that, but I think it is particularly now that people want to be able to see that you have kind of are able to do very nice drawings with kind of understanding line weights. And then to, and then this is more work for an office. Um, all right, I'm going to stop sharing. I did it under 45 minutes. That was good. So <clears throat> I think we can actually talk about maybe some questions that you might have. And everybody here from AWA has a lot of experience. So um, you can also ask, they can also answer about kind of what they look for when you have a portfolio. I'm just saying kind of what we look for is the kind of well-organized information, kind of obviously beautiful graphics, nice drawings, but then also uh, a range of skills, showing a range of skills in a way that's organized um, and that it's a kind of well-organized document. I think because we sort of imagine that if the, if the document, the portfolio is well-organized and very clear, that that's somebody that maybe we can work with because has a similar kind of sensibility in terms of thinking about kind of everything has to be very particular, like this goes here, this goes here, that that's maybe the aesthetic of our office, but that helps when we see the work uh, in a way that's very 
clean and has kind of room to breathe and is well organized and um, consistent. Well, thank you, Sarah. I think you're getting ready to open it up for questions. Yes. Yeah. Certain tons of people have questions. And so please don't be shy. Uh, put a question in the chat. Um, uh, we've got other people on the call that I'm certain can can help you out. So I see I'm going to I'm going to totally brutalize these names. So please, Ihan, I see you have your hand up. So I uh, go ahead and let's see if we can take you off mute and let you ask your question if you are OK with that. Hello. Hi. Yay. Yes. Hi. Yes. Thank you very much for sharing. This is very helpful. Um, I just have two very quick questions. Uh, so I'm an undergrad student and I'm currently applying for internships. And um, when I'm putting together my portfolio, um, like I'm usually told that like um, each project needs to have a, a complete story or a whole narrative. But from some of the examples that were shown, it looks like a lot of the projects only have like a few images, um, a few renderings. Um, so I was just like wondering how we should find a balance between the narrative and between like sharing our skills. And then um, a second question is, um, uh, so I interned at other studios before and I worked on different teams on different projects, but um, it's not very like um, coherent or it's not in the same style. So when I want to use uh, my previous works, should I um, mix them into one project or should I list them as different ones? Yeah, that's two oh. questions, thank you. Those are all really good questions. I'll start with the last one, what I would recommend. If you worked in an office, let's say that you were doing, um, you know, a door schedule for an office. I don't think that that's, I think you can make it interesting, especially it sort of shows that you have developed some skills in kind of understanding how to organize information for a set of drawings. So I think it's okay, maybe you would only have one page, but you could have like an image of, I think it would be nice to see that from, not just see like, page after page of renderings of, of projects that I don't even know if you worked on. But if you had like an image of the project that you could find and then you'd say, and this is the pieces that I worked on. I worked on this portion or I worked on this door schedule or I designed these bathrooms and just show that. I think it doesn't, nobody expects that you designed the whole stadium, right? If you did a little piece of it. But I think it shows that that you can say, okay, this, this work that I did had value and I did it in such a, and I found something, you know, even organizing a door schedule, there's a kind of art in that, right? And in, in how do you kind of clearly show information and that you understand how to organize that information. And I think that goes for <clears throat> your school projects too. There are some projects that you may choose to show many like that are really important to you that you think like this project was a very complete project that had a lot of components to it that might be interesting to an employer. Let's say if you did a housing studio and it's got the plans and it's got unit plans and it's got wall sections and it's got, you know, maybe more, most schools in Southern California tend to use housing as the comprehensive project. So I'm using that, not just because we do it at Cal Poly, but I know USC does the same thing in SciArc. So you might show more pages that kind of show the range of, of things that you thought about, but some other project you may think, okay, this was, this was important for this reason. Maybe it's only got a couple pages. So it doesn't mean Every project doesn't have the same level of importance in your portfolio and not every part. And I think what you want to do is show kind of the, the work that, that showcases kind of your knowledge and your skills and your interests in a way that 
also is clear to the employer that you have curiosity and that you have, you know, that you have rigor and that you do things in a way that you take your work seriously, regardless of what the work might be, right? From a design of a whole project for school or just a little component of a project for an employer. And can I jump in about the uh, amount of text to include? Um, I think that when you are writing a description or you're including text in your portfolio, you need to be, um, say what's important. I think uh, the important, the thing that, you know, any employer is going to want to see is that you actually know how to write a sentence and you can communicate, communicate clearly, but I think you can be careful in not going through and putting in a whole lot because honestly, we all have full-time jobs and we're reviewing a bunch of portfolios. And so there is a limit to the amount of some of stuff that somebody's going to read. So I would really try and keep it to a paragraph. Say the stuff that's important, but don't worry about, you know, going in and telling a whole, a whole page story about something um, that may not be meaningful. So just to fill, just to fill space, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think the portfolios I was showing, I, maybe I wasn't super clear. The ones that were like for jobs usually had very short descriptions. And just like, this is the location, the place, this is how, where I did this work. Here's an exp a short explanation of the project. And here's my involvement in it, if it was a group project or if it was done at work. A lot of the ones I showed you were grad school applications, in which case the criteria that they're looking at is different because they're looking at a kind of academic background. So those tended to have many more diagrams, many more explanations, more drawings yeah. tend to be longer, and there's a lot of text. But that's not usually the ones that you would send to an office. So no. it's just sort of depending on what your objective is. Cool. Um, did that answer your question, Ian? Um, yes, that did. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we do have a question in the chat. And it is from, I'm also going to brutalize this name, Noemi. Uh, it says, can I include non-architectural projects like maps for a comic book I'm working on? And this would be for grad school. Um, yeah, I mean, the grad school thing is a, <laughs> a whole other thing. But yes, I am including it. I think I would, as long as it serves a kind of architectural academic or a kind of academic endeavor. So uh, grad schools, it depends if you're doing like an MR2, I don't know if or this is like a first professional degree or second professional degree, but if it's a second professional degree, usually what they wanna see is I think they're interested in your ability to represent ideas. Um, and so if the map making or the comic books relate to an architectural investigation, then I think uh, that's useful um, if it ties into some larger, like Jimenez Lai did all these comic books and that was kind of part of his, his academic uh, work. So there's certainly a place for that. If it's, maybe you can answer, is this for a first professional degree or a second professional? Or... Yeah, me, are you, are you there? Please feel free to speak up. She's on mute. <laughs> I don't know if she's but, still there. Yeah. Anyway. So if it's a uh, oh. MR2, okay, yeah. So if it's an MR2, then they, they yeah. So MR1 is for people who don't have an architectural background. Mm. So they would be interested in whatever you've done that's creative, right? They don't care like pottery or whatever. It's like, I'm interested in creative activity. For MR2s, they wanna see that you have a kind of 
clear idea about how this other work that you're doing, map making or or comic books, um, if they tie into a kind of architectural mm. investigation. And I think there's probably a way to tie it in, like you could sort of explain why this is important. Uh, but they don't tend to be very interested in sort of if it's a hobby that's separate from an architectural or academic pursuit, then maybe I would leave it out like, yeah, like hand drawing or something that might be helpful for an M mark one, like I can draw, but M mark two, they want to know that you're, you have a very specific idea about what you want to do in grad school and how, if this is going to feed into that, then sure include it just explain how it feeds into your architectural kind of the academic pursuit that you want to continue doing or how you want to incorporate these media into architectural research thank you i also we have another couple questions um we have what is an appropriate number of projects to include for a professional portfolio I don't know. What do you think, Carol? I think like five or six is probably good. Yeah. Three or four. Yeah. I mean, I think you could go three to, depending on the complexity of the project, right? The important thing is that you are trying to, for a professional, you're trying to show experience and um, your, uh, you know, your plan, your detailing, you know, whatever, whatever you've worked on on it. So, sort of finding projects that um, are tailored to show what you do best or, you know, sort of show your best work. And so I think, yeah, but once you get too long, you know, I, I would say five to six at the, at the most would be my recommendation. If I may add uh, to it as a pragmatist who reviews uh, portfolios in the office, um, you know, from a very pedestrian point of view of a um, principal who is, let's say, my small office reviewing the um, portfolio, I know that, yes, if you're coming straight from the school, your schoolwork uh, needs to show an aptitude for architectural design. But I also realized that, you know, young people year um, after school or a couple of internships, sometimes you just are in the firm which does not do amazing work. And the important part is to not be afraid to show your technical aspect of that work and, you know, and say, this is why I'm changing the firm. Maybe I have greater aspiration. <laughs> But I think it's important that, you know, you don't try to make it pretty because you, we, I can see when you're trying to make it pretty. And I'm, I am, I, I understand that, you know, you, you know, straight from school, we're not designing yeah. this. What I'm interested in, whether you are a learner, whether you paid attention to the technical skills, whether you might have an artistic and at the same pragmatic approach because architecture is very pragmatic and um, uh, yes you do tailor in my opinion to the office you are sending the portfolio yeah. so there are you should look you know what you are interested in and send the portfolio tailored to that office if you know that the office is doing um, uh, one type of job and you're going to send a very graphically interested portfolio, they just, you know, get complete mismatch. They're not going to look at this. So be smart about that too. And I do have a follow-up question to Sarah. So um, three small questions. One is, does orientation, <laughs> vertical or horizontal of portfolio matters? That's one. The second, what is the minimum size of letters we could use? You know, I'm getting older. We do print uh, eight and a half by 11 and, you know, just on the computer, not a problem. We can 200% zoom, but does this matter for others? So that's two. And the third, when you have an out of ordinary 
portfolio, meaning breaks all the rules. You just talked about this, but it is a interestingly done. Would you recommend people do it? Mm. Ooh, those I are think, loaded questions. I think everybody's a little bit different. My, um, and probably you would get as many answers to that, uh, to all of those questions. I, I am maybe a little bit more pragmatic, maybe like you. I think the vertical in <laughs> by 11 is kind of the standard right now. And if you expect yeah. people to print it in an office and also just to look at it in the screen, and it's also how, it's sort of the, it's the most common format. Landscape is awkward if somebody doesn't even, you know, it's it's sort of, the eight and a half by 11 fits kind of how most people do proposals in offices and yeah. it's sort of a standard mm -hmm. format. And so if you can make something like the ones I showed you, those were all eight and a half by 11 vertical. And they all managed to pull off a very beautiful design within the constraints. None of them went full bleed either. Like they were all like very kind of, um, they had a lot of rules and a lot of kind of very simple ordering devices. Like they all had a simple margin that was white and things that, that you could imagine arriving in an office. Because if you send somebody something that's really weird, like 12 by <laughs> 17 or something, oh. they're not going to know what to <laughs> do with this Don't thing. Don't do that. So, you, can't, you can't print that. So I would say that. Uh, the, the non-standard portfolios that kind of arrive in a box, like, you know, those are those were the old days that people would, actually, I'll tell you a funny story. My husband's a graphic designer and he said, he sent, he sent he, he's Swiss, so he sent to the US uh, his portfolio and it was like, every drawing was wrapping a chocolate. <laughs> It's like a box of chocolates and it arrived like, and I'm like, what happened to your perfectly box of chocolates with every single project wrapped up? I don't know. It was like a very funny thing, but now we're friends with the person who received it <laughs> and she didn't hire him, but she did appreciate the box <laughs> of chocolates. Anyway, there you go. so uh, yeah. I don't know. I think it, Everything now grad schools are all digital. So all the submissions yeah. have very specific layouts and they're all pretty much in F by 11 vertical format and yeah. you have to submit online. And so I think, I think showing that you can work within um, the constraints, very, very limited constraints and do something that is very kind of that, that is very clear. I mean, mostly people are interested in the work, not in the yeah. form, not so much in the format of the work. I think the reason to yeah. have white space and have a kind of clear layout is so that people can focus on the image and not focus on all the stuff around the image, which sometimes yeah. kind of is hiding the, no? Hide, and hides the work. Yeah, and I like the portfolios because they were very clean. Um, and they look, they're very, very nice. I'm going to answer Magdalena's font size question. And I would not go less than 10 point font. Um, as you know, you can see I'm wearing glasses and bifocals at this point in time, or if I'm wearing my contacts, there's reading glasses. And so a printed out version, you, you've got to pay attention to, um, yeah, getting somebody. So if you have somebody that is uh, in their 50s or 60s or somebody that you know, please have them review your portfolio and ensure that they can read it, not just your friends, because you are all young and your eyesight is fabulous and you can read all sorts of little stuff that um, that some people can't read anymore. So I would I would ask for advice and just ensure that that I don't know if there's a minimum or a maximum because again, it's online and it's on the screen. And that is really the way most people will view it, I think. And you can zoom in and, and out. And I'm just gonna, so oh, that's it. 
we have one last question, and I think that this one is a is a really good one. Is how do you with, how do you consider a portfolio website? Will anyone look at it? Is it interchangeable with a PDF portfolio supplemental? And I don't I don't know the answer to that. I haven't I haven't viewed any websites. I always get like the thing. We get a lot of the webs. We actually get a lot of people with websites. Um, and we do look at them if they're available. They're hard to keep up, keep up. I don't think that they're necessary, and it's certainly not the first thing somebody's going to look at. But if you have it, then they might go and like. I think the last few people that we interviewed, they did have websites, and we sort of looked at them. But it's hard. It's a very different skill, and it's hard to do well. Yeah. So yeah, it kind of opens up a whole other set of issues so maybe it's maybe it's maybe it could backfire but if you have if you have a lot of skills and you have it and it matches your 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 pdf portfolio yeah then it could be helpful i was going to say that would be kind of right up there with if you have a really out of this world you know a non-traditional portfolio. You have to be really good at it in order to pull it off. So don't try and stifle. I, I would never want to stifle anybody's creativity, but you really have to be spot on great to be able to pull something unusual off. And I would say the same thing with a, with a website that you, it can't, uh, I'll use, it can't be half-assed, right? Because that will defeat that will defeat the purpose. It can't just be there to be there. Same thing with an unusual portfolio. It can't just be unusual to be unusual. You know, you're trying to communicate information and you're trying to show that you can communicate information. And so I think you should, um, that needs to be at the forefront. You'll have plenty of opportunities in your career to show other things. This isn't, this isn't the place um, necessarily to, to really go out there. That's my opinion. Anyway, I think, um, so we have run over by 10 minutes um, and I don't want to take uh, any more of Sarah and uh, Magdalene, every, any 